Gabriel. I'm Grayson. And I'm Gavin. And we're the, the cast. <laughs> <of Rome. laughs> yeah. I mean, it was partly just being in Australia too was probably one of the big genesis of it. And we'd made a show prior to this which had been set in a Berlin apartment um, and was all about claustrophobia um, and the kind of paranoias that exist in someone who spends too much time in their apartment in the middle of winter in Berlin. Um, so the, kind of it was the antithesis to that, to say that when going back to Australia and seeing this massive open space. And but still concentrating about, on paranoia. Yes, yeah, <laughs> we tend to concentrate on paranoia. But like the agoraphobia suddenly and what that landscape does. And then just yeah, starting to talk about these kind of things you grow up with in Australia, these urban myths of um, uh, you know, losing, running out of petrol and then the boyfriend going off to get... Um, going off to find a petrol station and then you're scratching on the roof and it's the yeah. killer with the boyfriend's head and, and all that kind of stuff <laughs> we kind of started talking about and loved. It was a big part of it too. Mm. We actually wanted to play with a few of exactly those things in the show, mm. like having the banging. Because it's, I don't know whether you have the same thing in Canada, it's really like a... It's an American one too, I think. That it's like a campfire yeah. story yeah. actually. Yeah, yeah. One of everyone knows it. You so sit around it's... and scare all the kids with. Like. Yeah. yeah, well the one with the, where the hitchhiker gets in and it's like it's I an know, old lady. Hairy. And then you kind of look down, and he has like hairy, muscly legs or something. Yeah. He's got an axe in his back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was all of those. And also, then there was a story in Australia um, of a backpacker that was murdered out in a very famous Peter Falconio story. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we started reading also like books about that story in particular. And what was fascinating, and what's fascinating in Australian kind of history, is people are more interested in the mystery than the case being solved. And maybe that was why that case was so prevalent in people's minds, because they never found the body. And there were all these rumors of Peter Falconio appearing, like somebody saw him at a surf shop, or you know, like right. all these kind of appearances. So there was this big mystery about whether it actually happened, whether she was lying. And she got you know, treated pretty badly by the media and stuff because actually people are more addicted to the mystery than they are to the truth sometimes. Mm -hmm. So in fact, yeah, that kind of fascination with the mystery and so on was also a big thing. And we actually looked at that kind of her testimony as part of one of the working things that started. And there's a scene in the piece which is pretty much based around her testimony at one point, even though the show is not the Peter Falconio mystery tour. <laughs> And then the whole piece was kind of um, meant to be uh, certainly taking kind of film ideas but mm -hmm. applying them to the stage and actually working out theatrical devices to do film ideas, really. Rather than just trying to put film on stage, it's not at all what we're trying to do. But, right. but actually we, there were certain things we wanted to do, like a first-person perspective of someone inside the car. Mm. I mean, if you can't do an extreme close-up on them... It's kind of easy to do that in film. You can just yeah. you know, zoom in on them. Yeah. So we were like, okay, how can we do that on the stage where we can't manipulate what people are looking at? Mm. We can't. So actually there the sound becomes really important because you live sort of the first-person experience through sound or through my experience through sound rather than mm. by really being able to see it so well. But yeah. We always try and just... Uh, pull the resources really, that everybody that's in the show is making the show. And then all the designers that come on board um, also start contributing their external kind of viewpoints mm -hmm. also, which is really valuable for in us. In a dramaturgical way. Yeah, yeah because we're actually inside the show. So this whole process just kind of starts, you know, with the three people who are tending to make the piece. It's just that we've had two works in a row that have had three people in them. Mm -hmm. um, so we directed and choreographed all <coughs> both of them, um, the three people, but then as soon as the designers came in, they were also the type of kind of people that became interested in the work, and then eventually the work itself is the director, that's always what we tend to say. And you know, at a, there's a certain point when the work has enough of its own direction that you know whether an idea is going to work or not. It's funny because when we, yeah, exactly. <laughs> when we first, when we first started, we basically, 
playing with the idea of making a horror film dance theatre piece. <laughs> and it's such a weird mix. Mm. And, and to some extent, we realise how silly this is, but we're deadly intent on trying to make that yeah. work. It's kind of love and of B grade also, yeah. you know. Mm. And, and actually there's parts where we have torches or whatever, we're shining them around and every now and then you catch glimpses of the audience and they're kind of holding each other <laughs> looking like this. We had people in Brisbane who actually asked to be taken out, like asked the theatre staff to take them to their car, like to walk them to the car after the show. Yeah. I never thought that it could be so effective like mm. to see a dance theatre piece and to actually get like, scared. Yeah. <laughs> and we have had some, yeah, you do get some audiences that are very vocal and gasp and, oh, yeah. you know. And school shows. Yeah, <laughs> school shows are insane. But in, yeah, and, and it's a really nice reaction actually because normally what you feel from, like in a dance theatre piece normally, if, you, if it's a comedy piece you'll hear them laugh, that's fairly usual I guess, but actually you hear an audience kind of gasp and stuff is, is really good for us. I think it's because nice the element of surprise works really well in this one as well, so it's not... Sure, you have a school show and the kids go nuts and they scream and squeal and whatever, but it's also really scary for the adults as well because it's, I don't know, there's all of that natural things that shock you and stun you and scare you as sort of built into the show. Mm. So, yeah, so it's kind of one of those things that doesn't matter what sort of experience the audience maybe has had prior, whether you like horror or you don't like horror, it sort of kind of vaguely has the same effect mm. on most of them. Yeah, I guess we're, I mean, we're hoping that the show treads a few different grounds, really. There's kind of B-grade horror thrill of it, um, and at the same time that there's themes underpinning it which are kind of deeper and stronger than that, mm. I guess. And so we're trying to play, I guess, both fields a yeah. little bit with it. And it's also like, it's because it is somewhat of a, it, it's not a story per se, but it's a, you really get the relationships between the people because there's only three of them. It's mm. also a really kind of an intimate performance from an audience perspective as well because they get to know us on stage so um, I don't know it's not like you're just executing something like they kind of go on the ride as well which is mm. I guess mm. actually, what actually that was important for us when we were first setting it up because you can't create anything scary if you don't care about the characters that are on stage mm. so we kind of mm. well particularly these two whatever I'm, I don't even enter for the first 20 minutes I'm just <laughs> <laughs> he's just a scary <coughs> freaky local guy yeah, yeah so that's certainly what they play with at the beginning yeah so you really get to know them and, and it in that sense also it's quite theatrical it's not about mm. coming on I mean probably clearly from already from what we've been saying but it's not really just about this abstract movement we kind of create a base and then when this movement comes it's to explain something that can't be explained in words. Mm. Mm. And also the beauty, yeah, that movement always can tell something um, more abstract. So we're always coming from a kind of concrete place into abstraction. That's why kind of you have things like the car, they're like your anchors to the real world. Mm. Um, because of course dance is an abstract language so it can take you off into complete dream places and fantasies and all that kind of stuff which is what's beautiful about it. But to have the anchors means you can also bring the audience back and give them something to hold on to. And that's something we tried to do a lot in this piece, that we would go and it would start very linear, in fact, and then fractures off. And, but always we're coming back when we feel like the audience needs something to hang on to, we bring them back. 